The year is 1905. Banishing Native American tribes. You must do a podcast. Year by year, event by event. I'm afraid it is the only way to save humanity. I am the angel of time. Oh, good evening. Hello, Phil. How are you? Yeah, all right. Where are we going uh, in the old time machine on our podcast that we do today? Today it's back to 1905. Native Americans just disappearing from the tamed West, no longer the wild West. So Let's just get in this bloody time machine. Mm-hmm. Pile in. Time change. There's something quite uh, apocalyptic about the way the American tribes are vanishing from the landscape at this point. Because in most dystopias, from the narrative perspective, it's the world like falling into disarray and you're confronted with a new reality. And this is sort of what is happening with the Native Americans at this point. Yeah. When they're, they're first of all bumping into Western settlers... Uh, not necessarily the trained army, um, but the first Western settlers that come in are poking around, building a little farmstead, and you're sneaking up to see what's going on. They start shooting you. Yeah. You in reprise will kill them, and then the word spreads that it's a wild frontier. Yeah, and then it's just endless conflict. Yeah, yeah, and you suddenly realise, hey, shit, I poked the bear. Yeah, and now, want... now they're coming, and they're taking all my lands. And... You'd almost rather fight the military than those angry bears, mm. settler bears. Yeah. Vengefully protecting their, their Yeah, land. but th- th- this was the absolute Wild West at this time. Hey! It's called Wild West for a reason. <laughs> yeah. God, it was like the Wild West of... <laughs> wild West. The Wild Wild West. When Jim I rolled West. into the... Desperado, rough rider. No, you don't want neither. None of this six gun in this. We talked about the Panama Canal and how America was interfering and flexing its imperial muscles, so it's able to uh, to have bigger ambitions now that it has mastered its westward expanse, which finished relatively relatively recently for them. Yeah, they were still a frontier culture up into the 1890s and 1900s, early 1900s. Now they're just transitioning into a global superpower. But yeah, the, before they fought all these. Uh, I think you meant the Native Americans are transitioning into a global superpower. I was going to say, I don't think Oh, no, no, no. They're the very much on the way. Um, <laughs> they were never really any sort of uh, great force because the Spanish had been wiping them out for uh, many years prior to when America as a country came into being. Like the, like the Burrs, um, they did have some interesting strategies, I guess, based around like. Knowing, knowing the landscape really well, and mm. but, well, but they, uh, uh, they were great fighters. They managed to put up some good resistance to the Western expanse but, um, of America. But yeah, they were no match for guns and cannons, and you know, just the march of Western civilization destroying a very, um, a very old way of life that hadn't adjusted to the twentieth century. No industrialization. No. Uh, large-scale farming or anything, a nomadic existence, and they were always going to be wiped out at some point. And here we're just seeing the tail end of them. And there's a a photographer called Edward Curtis, and he's sent on this expedition uh, to record their life. Photography, as we talked, has been around for a while, but it's now actually getting quite crisp and quite good. And Edward Curtis spends 20 years crisscrossing North America and recording all the histories and legends and songs and language of like 80 different tribes that are still surviving in this point and still have some rooting in the old ways, but it's just dying out and they're becoming sort of assimilated into the modern American nation that we know it, like pulling in yeah, uh, pulling in people from Europe at this time as well uh, yeah. and trying to mould a new nation. And unfortunately, yeah, the, the original inhabitants of the land, their story is sort of buried from this point on, subsumed by the new America, the Uncle Sam. Yeah. Who used just who even after the wars 
have officially ended, I think continue to use the most like horrific tactics. I think one like wiping out. Um, I think there was. I, I, I'll have to double check the date, but I, they were like handing out um, sort of aid blankets to to um, um, but they infected them with like the smallpox virus to try and wipe out some tribes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they used some pretty fiendish sort of what we would term now biological warfare. Fiendishly yeah. effective and yeah, decimating whole tribes just by passing on cholera. I think it was one illness particularly that devastated them. Because they had no no sort of immunity. immunity to it whatsoever. Wasn't that a thing with COVID lately? Weren't there a few tribes? Either they were, either it did reach them and it completely wiped them out, or they were worried about it reaching them. I don't know. Again, a bit of research. That's a very good little. I I zoned out there actually. I was thinking of uh, sitting bull. Sitting bull. <laughs> Sitting bull, <laughs> not fair. Um, I was, I'm looking at your the uh, Alex Arbuckle photos that you've mentioned. Alex Arbuckle, Edward Curtis, and they're very evocative images. And are these sort of? I know I was about to say, did he romanticise? In his efforts to capture and record a vanishing way of life, Curtis sometimes meddled with the documentary authenticity of his images, posing his subjects in romanticised settings, stripped of signs of Western civilization more representative of an imagined pre-Columbian existence than the subject's actual lives in the present. So there is a bit of naughtiness going on, but Curtis's body of work still one of the most... He's quite interesting, though, because he's creating a (coughs) form of artwork as well, using photography as art, uh, not just as a record, but he's primarily a documentarian. He's documenting all of these things, not just from photography, but from the songs and the oral histories. So I think he's allowed to play around a little with the composition. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't beat him too much for having an artistic bent to these photos. But yeah, definitely, he's, he's, uh, true. he's certainly making them put on the native headdress and the one with the feathers that is and very evocative. That was the style, whereas now we'd crave probably the photo that would do it for us would be actually showing mm. them with the encroaching Western civilization. Exactly. Well, his most famous Baxter. photograph was definitely staged. Uh, it's called... Cool. I think it's called Vanishing Tribes or something. Uh, I'll, I'll bring that up and show you. But it's, it's nonetheless very evocative of Is that the, the woman with the, in the river? No. I don't know what the one in the river is. But no. Uh, you sent me one of Arbuckle's. Edward Curtis. Who's Arbuckle? I have no idea who Arbuckle is. <laughs> who is Arbuckle? Okay, sorry. This is a question for you. You, Ar- you figure out who Arbuckle is. Arbuckle wrote this, this, the thing you sent me about the photographer, Edward Sheriff Curtis. Okay, yeah. You I confused up the journalist, right? Curtis for... No. Yeah, it's Edward Curtis who we're looking at. Because Arbuckle's this, this quite This guy here, mate. because we're face-to-face, I can show you today. This dapper-looking frontiersman. He's uh, clad not in a Panama hat, but some sort of curly Stetson. Yeah. Little goatee. He basically looks like a character that you would design from Red Dead. Yeah. And this is exactly the sort of period we're looking at here, where he's going around the country. He's like a Red Dead side mission, effectively. Yeah. Because he's been given a camera <laughs> and told, yeah, go off into the wilderness, <laughs> document these tribes, see what you can put up. I already so, hate him. Yeah, so to much beat him with the stick of like, side ah, missions. ah, he's posing. Yeah, his, stop doing his, that! His, his characters. He, he was allowed some artistic license. He does a good job. Yeah, and you, you get hit the mission from him and have to just like ride ages away and find someone else mm. and then maybe carry him back on your horse and he'll yeah. fall off. Yeah, exactly. Find some plants to, to fix him, some of the yeah. native plants. But this is what he was doing in a way. He was learning about uh, the whole traditions, like the medicine aspect of it as well, recording the ceremonies and rituals of these tribes. Okay. I don't know whether he actually took part in any of like, them passing the peace pipe or something. I must, he must have done. If he's that deep in, he's got to be passing the pipe. I, I, I would like to hope pass so, yeah. The pipe. yeah. Well, I don't know whether he tried some of the stuff like peyote cactuses as well. They're quite potent hallucinogenics. Let's have a look and see. This is his most famous picture uh, called The Vanishing Race. Oh, can you pop that music on? What's, did he get that one? What's, what, did he do that album, the Native American tunes you were playing? No, no, he didn't. Um, it was like you're looking at the cover art. It looks a bit more modern. It is. I think this is, 
he has some sort of record label who's put out the best of American, Native you, American. Do you mind discording me that? Indian tune? Yeah, sure. They've actually called it American Indians here, which I don't think they should have. So it's probably like 20 years old. Oh, yeah, maybe we shouldn't be playing this song. Northern Cherokee. Much that once was is lost. We are time tripping. For I can see what is to come. We are time tripping. Much that once was is lost. Go back, go back. Learn the lessons. It is the only way to avoid catastrophe. Is it this like something would be on sale at the casino? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Why not? It's better than Ed Sheeran. He probably plagiarised all his music from the Native Americans, didn't he? I'm not an Ed Sheeran fan. I couldn't name I'm not one Ed of Sheeran his songs. Fan. Oh, you're not. I was referencing the fact he's always up in court for ripping off people's songs. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. It's an example of how the Native Americans didn't keep up with uh, the modern day, though. Like copywriting stuff, they just had no no conception of that at that point. They never had a chance. It sort of forced forced itself on them in mm. a very yeah. I mean, the, the, from my understanding, I'm looking to you as the expert on this because you did do a little bit in school. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, but they sort of shoved the Native Americans into backed them into a corner first rather and then shoved them into reservations so once they'd beaten them militarily and were chasing them across wherever it might be like Nevada and Utah um, from one end and then you've at this point got the rise of the big coastal cities in California um, and Seattle and they're pushing them from the other direction and yeah just getting squeezed out from their ancestral homelands then pushed up north I believe towards the Canadian border and just all the way having to march and march because they don't want to have to be incorporated into the American world, the new way. Uh, but they've got no way to escape it, really. It's like, again, like, um, yeah, the beginning of, like, modern technology meeting that kind of... Like, like the Burr like Bur War, you have the first concentration camps and just all these really creepy biological mass subjugation tactics feels like a similar thing the urge to destroy to wipe out unfortunately this is something we're going to encounter more and more as we voyage through the 20th century but when we talk about the trail of tears this was sort of an ethnic cleansing and forced displacement of i guess 60,000 odd people from five civilized tribes and that took place between 1830 and 1850 then you got the Civil War kicking in, I think, in 1860. 60s, yeah. And that occupies the American government for a long time. Yeah, so, from uh, yeah, <laughs> when they sort of fighting amongst themselves. But as soon as that's really over, relieved that everyone, oh, all of the US neighbours are probably really relieved for that mm, fight. Yeah, it? yeah. But it's like most countries; they have a little implosion when they're setting up, and then one side wins out on one side. Yeah. Whereas Europe's already had all this big civil wars. Uh, actually, not, not true. <laughs> not true at all. You're not true. Sure <laughs> but what am I saying here? Yeah, every country is volatile at this point. Yeah, we America, that we're no in. Traditional we're back Native back. American life is so fading into obscurity, with the tribes facing a rapid decline and loss of their lands and cultural heritage. Their unique communities and ancestral territories will ultimately all be absorbed into the United States of America. Do you have a favourite Native American? Make it a policy never to pick favourites, uh, Johnny. Okay. Um, I don't Top know if... ten, then? Top ten Native Americans? I don't think I do have a specific favourite Native <laughs> and I feel like pretty bad for it now. Um, just anyone in the Sioux tribe. I don't know, really. <laughs> anyone in the Sioux tribe? Who have, uh, Susie. Oh, what's, who's your man who was at Wounded? Susie and the Banshees. Susie, Sue and the Banshees. That's later, the 20th century. Yeah, true. True. Um, but was she in the Sioux tribe? Susie. I suppose we'll have to look it up, won't we? You seem to be put on the spot by that one. 
I did know it, but I've forgotten. No, I think it's just a affected 80s type stage name. Oh, they're actually a British band. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know they were British. So yeah, they've got no relation to the Sutra. Um, who's the one who was at Wounded Knee? Sitting Bull, was that? It might have been. Is that who you're going to say is your favourite? I, I am going to have Sitting Bull as one of my favourites. Yeah. Sitting Bull was, of course, Custer's nemesis. Uh, Buffalo Bill was a friend of Sitting Bull, and the military tried to get him involved. Do you know what Sitting Bull was named at birth? Lying Bull? No, Jumping Badger. <laughs> Are you joking? Jumping Badger? That was his birth name. Oh, right. Did they have badgers? Yeah, North America has badgers. Uh, I've never heard of it. There. Well, they're not the most exciting animal when you've got pumas and bears and wolves and bison. Yeah. Honey it's the sort badgers. of thing you'd name a baby. Badger. Honey badgers. Honey badgers, they're from a different continent, I believe, Africa. Yeah, just regular. Regular, and what's he called? Peaceful badger? Jumping badger. That bird. Oh, wounded knee isn't. The... There's one where the um, Native Americans absolutely destroyed the military. That's what I was looking for. This is the Wounded Knee Massacre, which is just horrible. It was like the last stand of uh, Sitting Bull and co. He was like a proper leader at that point of a, of a movement because he was actually a warrior. There weren't too many uh, warrior leaders left at this point. At the, when was this? 1890s? He was killed in 1890, so yes. I mean, he, he was the one who led his people, basically, during the years of resistance. And he was killed by Indian agency police on the Standing Rock Reservation when they were trying to arrest him. So, to, so that, he wasn't killed in battle, but... Is that what kicked really. off Wounded Knee, even? I know that he was involved in the Battle of Little Bighorn. Oh, yeah, so... That was, his, that was one of his famous battles. So he got shot by the... Policeman. Yeah, so this was uh, Custer's last stand, where Custer is surrounded by a perfect ambush. Yeah, that's the one I... Of the tribe. So Sitting Bull was there? Yeah. Yeah, right, well I'll go Sitting Bull for the Battle of Little Bighorn, and not Wounded Knee, which must have been... uh, which was kind of a response, I guess. How early was Bighorn? Bighorn. Little Bighorn or Big Bighorn? (laughs) Little Bighorn. (laughs) Little Bighorn was 1876. Do you know who else was fighting on the uh, on the side of the Native Americans? Uh, Crazy Horse. Oh yeah. Two Moon Gal and one called Lame White Man, who was a Cheyenne battle chief who fought at a little big one and killed there. Why is the only uh, only Cheyenne chief to die in battle? Does it say um, how he got his name? Lame White Man. Let's see. I wonder what that's uh, how. He that... was also known as Bearded Man. Although he doesn't have a beard, so I don't know if that was like a, a joke, like calling someone shorty when they're big. Yeah. Tiny. Um, He's called Mad Hearted Wolf as well. They have lots of names for their leaders. I wish I had uh, names. But I, I don't know why he was called Lame White Man. Lame White Man. How did Lame White Man... I think I found out what it means, because he was very good at laming white men, um, because he was always out in front in battle. Oh, okay, right. So he's not like a sort of like lame as in rubbish no, white right. man. He's actually properly laming. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair play, yeah. So a noble lamer. The noble lamer. Like, yeah, nowadays he'd be called the lamer. <laughs> <laughs> of his gamer handle. Yeah. Lamer. The lame leads. white man, yeah, or lamer. I don't know, probably lamer. The with leads the lamer. E as a free. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if he'd play Red Dead. Did I show you the vanishing race photo? I, 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 I'll blow it up on a big, bigger version. But can we turn this on again? So this is Edward Curtis's most famous photo called Vanishing Race, and it's of uh, Navajo Indians on horseback riding off into the dusty distance. And there's a sort of hazy, grainy quality to it. And it's very well composed because you've got one horse in the foreground and then a little trail leading off down this dusty path with 
mountains on one side. And I think it best shows what we're trying to tell the story of, like American just fading from the uh, from the society, Amazing. melding back into the landscape and becoming absorbed into American society, but without really the flourishing of their culture that they used to have, their customs and religions and so on. Something of the dark unknown. And the... Yeah, you can sort of almost see like a Vegas casino standing out here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then a reservation in front of it, and uh, the trail of tears behind it. Yeah, you know, the idea of a certain nobility to their exit, because they had, as we've discussed with uh, the likes of City Bull and Geronimo, they really did try to fight back and resist this fate. Just got steamrolled. Totally. History of history. Repeats itself, repeats itself. History repeats itself, repeats itself. History of history repeats itself, repeats itself. First as a tragedy, then as a farce, repeats itself. I'm pretty sure that Sitting Bull did partake in the hallucinogenics. Oh, yeah. Because oh, I he, he was, was, aside from a warrior, also a revered holy man. And he would participated in one sun dance ceremony where he danced for 36 hours straight, was making cuts in his arm, uh, yeah. like 50 sacrificial cuts and a pattern on his arm before he fell into a trance. It sounds like he's on a cotton comic relief doing it for charity, 36 hour dance. Uh, it would have been, yeah, quite something to behold, I'm sure. There's a picture here on the screen of a Navajo Indian deep into his trance dance. Well, I think the... the lead up to the Wounded Knee Massacre involved um, some kind of uh, dance, ghost dance, or sort of the introduction of something. Yeah, there, there were ghosts there, because when he awoke, actually, from this awesome 36-hour trance marathon, uh, he revealed that he'd had a vision of US soldiers falling like grasshoppers from the sky, which he then interpreted as an omen uh, that the army would be defeated. Yeah. But it wasn't. No. They were massacred. He, I mean, he, he did well defeating Custer. But that was only one battle. Won the battle, didn't win the war. Yeah, it was only 600 men under Custer that, that rallied out. And they sort of entered into a valley. And Sitting Bull was with his mate Crazy Horse. And they were gathering up the women and the children and taking them to a safe place. Mm. And then he led over 3,000 Native American warriors into this valley and prepared an ambush. Yeah. So you had 600 cavalrymen, even though they've got rifles and pistols, they're still going to be overwhelmed. Probably the Indians by this point also had a fair bit of firepower. They weren't just using bows and arrows, for example. It was quite a vicious firefight. Little, is this Little Bighorn? Yeah, yeah, Little Bighorn. And then Wounded Knee is like the reprisal. It's a bit like the Boer War thing, where you get the sort of underdog victory and then the power rides back in full of anger hate and the urge to kill you yeah yeah there's a good parallel there between the boer war what was going in there with the british yeah um we mentioned it was like a settler environment in south africa at this time again for want of a better frame like a red dead style sandbox yeah riding around the veld sandbox, well. here here you're in like the north american landscape again with similar like wide open spaces and deserts so a lot of places to retreat to if you are a mobile and agile army yeah which is what the native americans were what is it about like what happened <laughs> i keep 1905 <laughs> I keep what happened <laughs> what is it What's the event itself? It's called Vanishing Tribes. It's the idea that Native Americans are just vanishing from the American landscape. So it was the date that this, the guy, Sheriff, took the pictures, the photos of them. Yeah, the, the, 1905. He was... Not Sheriff, Curtis. Edward Curtis. Edward Sheriff Curtis. Oh, OK. You're referring to him by <laughs> middle name, name. as <laughs> one often does. Because I couldn't remember. You're going to refer to me as James from now on. James Arbuckle. OK. Wait. Um... Yeah, Sheriff, he was photographing for a long time, 20 years in total. But this particular picture is from 1905. What do you see here? We're looking at this. Uh, it says uh, Ab Ab Absaraki War Group, 1905, and it's three Native Americans in full uh, sort of headdress. And 
they're on horseback looking into the distance and one of them's holding a sort of long it looks almost like a weird hook or a ropey scythe uh, or maybe it's a standard i don't know spear perhaps either way now we now what i know that he posed so many of these i can really see it i can really feel the theatric it's a bit over theatrical somehow mm. but that's life make a good album cover yeah, I'm sure lots of bands have gone that way. Maybe Neil Young and Crazy Horse. Yeah. I entrust you with this sacred mission. Quick, idiots. History is starting to unravel. So the settlers were also urged by the government to shoot as many buffalo. And they just did it without oversight and even encouraged trains that were passing by. They, if you saw a herd of bison or buffalo... The train would stop and everyone would get out their guns and just shoot them all. Just and then the train moves on. To deprive them of food. Yeah, yeah this was the sort of devilish tactic we were thinking about. Oof. And this is just the settlers doing this and the local government. So everywhere they're going, they're pushing you further away yeah. because if they see you, they sort of shoot you or are hostile towards you. They're wiping out your food. And the government using the extreme settlers to sort of creep... Ever mm. out. So it reminds me of the West Bank. Yeah, very much. I think this is a, a tactic that was in use then and is still in use today. Where you're using a sort of militarised settler army to push your frontiers. God. Mm. Spurred the US expansionist dream. Interestingly, so, um, the invitation of Theodore Roosevelt, our old mate, Teddy, um, six chiefs were invited to march in his inaugural pro- parade. Juana Parker from the Comanches, Buckskin Charlie from the Ute, American Horse from the Sioux, Little Plume from the Blackfeet tribe, Hollow Horn Bear and Geronimo from the Apache tribe. And uh, the newspapers papers of the day were quick to remind readers of the Indian Wars, emphasising the blood spilled by frontier settlers at the hands of Native Americans. Spilled off, surely it means. Going, labelling them as savages. So, um, they kind of rejected this little diplomatic sop that Roosevelt's done. A lot of people are very angry, still remembering the blood spilled of the poor old settlers. Well, it wouldn't be pleasant to be scalped. No, but... You know, I think in the grand scheme of things, when you look at the amount of people scalped and the amount killed by cholera infested blankets, (laughs) you know, the balance of the scales is heavy (laughs) on one side. You can't, so I don't want to be too critical of the very violent methods that the Native Americans employed. Um, it's quite there was a, um, a member of this inaugural committee called Woodworth Clum. Um, questioned Roosevelt's decision to invite the chiefs to the parade, especially Geronimo, who apparently had actually been first captured by Clum's father, an Apache agent. God, all the, I wasn't quite aware of the um, intricacies of these Indian agents that they put on specific tribes. Um, anyway, the reason I started this is because Clum said, uh, Why did you... Why, Mr. Beckham, I'm going to go in Clum. Woodworth Club, why did you select Geronimo to march in your parade, Mr. President? He is the greatest single-handed murderer in American history. Roosevelt uh, simply said, I wanted to give the people a good show. Fiercely political, quite LBJE. Uh, Colonel Pratt, who was the head of the Carlisle Indian School, had a famous phrase, Kill the Indian, save the man. Meaning, take their culture out of them and save them. Save the, the, the savages. Pratt by name, Pratt by nature. Yeah, the Indian was out of sight, out of mind at this point. The notion in 1905 was that the Indian was going to disappear, the vanishing American. So this is almost answering my own question of why 1905, apart from our... Edward Curtis, you've got this amazing uh, thing going on in the inaugural parade. You know that as a fight is sort of over when you're in the parade, just as like a waving, yeah, yeah. GG, you tried. Definitely. Now all off to the reservations. 
exactly. And um, yeah, tribal land surveyed and divided up. It seems that the chiefs sort of went and did it just because um, Native American issues were so dropping off the radar at that point that they just needed to be visible. Mm. I'm getting all this from smithsonianmag.com. Oh, okay. here's another bit. According to a contemporary account, Norman Wood's lives of famous Indian chiefs, the chiefs were granted an audience with the president a few days later. Geronimo made his appeal through an interpreter. Great father, he said, my hands are tied as with a rope. My heart is no longer bad. I will tell my people to obey no chief but the great white chief. I pray you cut the ropes and make me free. Let me die in my own country, an old man who has been punished long enough and is free. Oh. You never played the Red Dead single player, did you? Red Dead Redemption single player storyline. No. <laughs> First, why not? Because it's uh, a really good briefing for this time not. period. However, I've, I just read a really sad Geronimo quote. 101 of frontier education in the 21st century. I know, I just thought you might have gone, oh, Geronimo. But the Red Dead single player was always about £60, whereas I got the online only version for five. I usually just down as many people as possible and hide their bodies <laughs> in a hotel room and wait the police out of my house. Camp own. out with some flaming arrows and yeah. sticks of dynamite. Yeah, and coming back to the guy we mentioned at the start, Edward Curtis's photos, I think a lot of them depicting a way of life that really wasn't going to be around even in the next sort of 10 or to this sort of march of progress uh, march of civilization, just sort of turn them into some sort of outcasts in their own land, quite sad and I think um, I think the, the image the, the, the image from uh, Curtis that I found actually most resonant is, the, is not the one he released but the undoctored image of the um, Native Americans with uh, a mechanical alarm clock sitting there in the middle, um, I mean, in the middle of them. Um, far be it from me to criticise century-old photographers, but that's the fucking money shot. That alarm clock, what it represents, why it's there, what, how it wouldn't have been used previously, because obviously um, it would be going by the, the sun and the dawn. That alarm mm. clock is just, it says it all, really. Mm. Yeah, that, that photo is definitely the one, the one to sum it up. Their time is running out, they're, uh, they're out of place in this new world. Yeah. What did you bring uh, back? What swag did you nick from them? S Native so Americans. I, I didn't I didn't steal it. I actually paid for this. I paid twenty five cents for one of Geronimo's buttons. In nineteen oh five he was doing a, a tour with Theodore Roosevelt and he was uh, sort of going to this Teddy Roosevelt's inaugural oh, parade yeah. and while he was journeying around he was uh, travelling across the country on the train and there were crowds who wanted to meet him and uh, get a little piece of of him, basically. And he was selling these buttons. So I took uh, one of them, paid my 25 cents, and have his buttons. Although someone else told me uh, that he was doing exactly the same thing at the next station. So it seems he's just buying up buttons and sewing them on as quick as the people... What kind them. of buttons? Um, just buttons, shirt buttons... It's shirt buttons, yeah. It's not very glorious, but it is light and travels back to the 21st century very easily. Just pop it in the pocket. It's true. I mean, we have a time machine. You could uh, size shouldn't shouldn't be an object, but yeah, all right, I'll allow it. <laughs> what, what did you take, Phil? Um, I might just bring back one of their like, not you know, like their bongs. One of their bongs? You mean a peace pipe? Sure. Okay. Well, let me know how it goes. Ah. Maybe, uh, tell me if it's a nice, smooth smoke. Well, I've brought it back, haven't I? I've brought it back. You haven't tested it yet. It's here. Imperial euphoria, death of Queen Victoria. Not a people warning her. Not for sure the conquered bird. Scorched her packets, not the fight. Concentrated.